Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Last Week in Rugby on the Bonus Point Rugby Podcast. Once again, I'm your host, TJ Olsen, and today's episode is brought to you by our amazing sponsors. First off, Whale Bird Kombucha. If you're looking for a great tasting beverage that is actually good for you, go try them out at your local Whole Foods, Air One, and other health food stores. Secondly, the Rugby Nation. The Rugby Nation are the leaders in strength and conditioning specifically for rugby players. They will be releasing their 30-day shred fat like the pros program this month, and the official challenge will begin on November 1st. This plan includes all the nutritional info and the best part is no gym is required. If you're looking to join in on this challenge, check out the Rugby Nation's website or look out on our social media page for a special discount code. Lastly, OsteoStrong LA. OsteoStrong is a unique state-of-the-art wellness center located in Mar Vista that has outstanding results with strengthening bones, joints, and muscles. In just 10 minutes per week, you can increase strength, bone density, improve posture, balance, and most importantly for rugby players, your athletic performance. So if you're interested, go check out osteostrongla.com to book your free consultation today. So over the weekend, we had another great weekend of Mighty 10 Cup Rugby and finally saw the long-awaited return of Test Match Rugby. As you can see, yeah, we've baby. got two people on either side of us. We've got a Wallabies fan, we've got an All Blacks fan, so I can't wait to get stuck in and introduce our guests. Uh, please welcome to the show regular guest analyst Tavita Halafia, aka rapper Nobel Capote, and head coach of Cal Poly's Rugby Club in the Central Coast of California, Mr. James Tessarero. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to the show. How are we doing? What's up? Good, mate. Thanks doing? for having me on. No problem. Good to, good, to, good, to have, yeah, good to good to have a good balance now. So it's it's good to have some chat and not be it just Wade or Blacks in general. So I, I just <laughs> want to say quickly congratulations to the LA Lakers on getting that victory over the Miami Heat. Winning that championship. <laughs> You're winning, rubbish. You're all rubbish, for, mate. For Kobe and LA. You are and plus to uh, Huller's favorite player, uh, LeBron James, yeah. getting getting the finals MVP. Uh, Huller, Huller yeah, what do you, you think of the series? Did, did you, did you Penetration. Like <laughs> we, we, we were talking about it pre pre production, and we were saying we're going to play play insert a word Pen, penetration. Where where would it go to? Insert oh, a sentence. Look. People can penetrate LeBron James however way they want to. <laughs> James James, what do you what do you think of the series? Obviously, a big big basketball fan as well. You are. What what do you think of the series entirely? Mate, I was just glad that we got a, uh, a competitive series out of it. After two games, it looked like it was going to be a sweep and um, yep. that'd be Agreed. a shame. But, mate, the Heat were great. Um, they fought hard. And uh, I think at the end, they just ran out of steam. And um, yeah. Well, you can, you can definitely see, like, even, even in game five, when Jimmy Butler got to the end of the game, and he, he went and drove for that layup um, or the dunk. And then he just went and stood on the side and just was heaving the whole time. So, yeah, definitely competitive. Uh, definitely great, great congratulations to the Lakers on that championship and Huller's favorite player, LeBron James. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll continue, but uh, J James, just before we jump into the rugby about over the weekend, t can you tell us what it's been like to rug run a rugby program around these difficult circumstances with COVID? Yeah, I'd be happy to, mate. Um, so as you introduced me, I'm the head coach at Cal Poly, which is one of the, um, one of the D1A programs based out of California. Uh, we typically play a season which would run pre-season right now through the fall. Uh, and then after Christmas, we play through the winter, we play our conference season and we play about uh, 10 matches against other Div 1 universities. Um, so we kind of run about a 22 or 24 week season, which should be starting now. Obviously, the, uh, the virus is playing havoc with campus life, uh, rugby all over the place and with college sports throughout the States. Um, and the situation at Cal Poly is no better than most of the other universities in the area where uh, kind of they're, they're, most of the kids are doing their classes online. Um, the campus is a bit of a ghost town and the student clubs like ours are forbidden to do any face-to-face -face, um, activities. Well, that's been, that's uh, been getting, you, getting you kind of uh, your skills handy for cutting film and, and going through a lot of virtual sessions with Zoom? And, and how's, how's that been? How have you been engaging the players? Exactly. So I think like every organization around the planet is pretty much adapting to uh, kind of sharing information and collaborating online. And it's a little bit harder and it takes a little bit more planning than just getting people together in a room and kind of chatting stuff out and letting it happen. So, um, yeah, my, I spend most of my uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in front of a in front of my computer cutting film, and then on Wednesday night we present a Zoom educational session for the players. Uh, we have about 80, 80 players. Uh, it's about probably fifty 
or 60 male players and about 20 or 25 ladies. Um, they all get together on the Zoom. Um, so we And there's a huge range of experience and talent. So we've got kind of 18-year-old girls who've never seen a rugby game. And we've got a guy who just got drafted in the first round of the MLR <laughs> on the same yeah. Zoom. And yeah. that's the challenge of our program. And that's what's amazing about our program. But I now have to do, like tomorrow night, for example, I'm doing a, a laws, uh, a Zoom educational session on laws of rugby. And I've got to stagger it on timing based yeah. on how experienced you are. And mm. we'll start with teaching five points for a try, run forward, pass backwards. And then at, wow. the end of the Zoom, at the end of the Zoom, we've got like an NLR level referee on who'll talk us through the, um, some of the trickier areas of law. Like kind of Monday. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's intense. I, that is yeah, intense. Well, well I, I think if anyone can get it done, I think I think it's you, James. So we, we hope to see collegiate rugby and Cal Poly rugby, especially back up and running soon. And if anybody's interested interested in the Cal Poly rugby program, go check them out at calpolyrugby.com. Uh, but without further ado, let's get stuck into talking about the rugby last week. So as as usual, another sensational weekend in Mitre Ten Cup rugby, and I'm I'm super excited to see the NRC kick off as well. So um let's let's just like previous weeks we're going to run through our rapid recap of games of week five so yeah, one two lost to canterbury 10 34 so that's no surprise there one two has been having a pretty trash season uh the Naki, a trash decade yeah <laughs> <laughs> why, why 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 can't you just let let me get through this without throwing shade to someone jeez so Taranaki losing a close match against Auckland, 28 to 29. That was a really good match. Uh, North Harbour had a rocky start to the season, but ended up getting a monstrous win over the people who hold the Ranfurly Shield, aka Hawks Bay, 46 10. But luckily, it wasn't at home for Hawks Bay, so they still hold the shield. Uh, Wellington losing a close one to Otago, 34 to 35. So a couple of close matches. Uh, my, Waik- my Waikato Mulu beat the county's Manukau Steelers 36-13, so super happy about that one. Uh, Tasman Marquor triumph over the Bay of Plenty 33-7. And our feature game of the week, we get to talk about Northland, the Tanifa beating the Southland Stags 18-14 in beautiful Whangarei. So I've got my lovely Southland shirt. They've been killing it uh, the, this past season. So super excited to talk about this one. But um, I thought the game was sensational. Both teams coming into this matchup, They've had quite a good start to their seasons and they were quite evenly matched. But the one thing I really enjoyed about this matchup specifically was Southland's ability to contain Northland's strong line out. So yep. Northland, for a perspective, Northland are ranked number two in the whole comp. Um, that's both conferences of their try origins coming from line outs. And Southland disrupted that quite, pretty well. So Hala, what was your favorite part of the game altogether? Dude, the forward packs going at it, like just bashing each other dude yeah, yeah. um did i noticed too like around the rock defense was just disgusting like people yeah. were shooting and they weren't mm-hmm. shooting for any other reason outside of they just looking for the first ball handler and the amount of turnovers uh, like what they weren't high i suppose it's the quality of the turnover from the initial hit mm-hmm. um to the second man on and just the and, and also shout out to the ref because he was letting that play through he was playing the advantages Instead of calling it for uh, holding the ball on the ruck, he let it play out. And that worked for both teams, um, you know, especially on towards some of their tries uh, and set phase, uh, well, next set pieces. Um, but, yeah, I, I re- like, I thought the um, the young hooker for Northland. Yep, yep. Um, I had his name. Oh, hold on, it's, it's on my notes. There's, there's too, there's the too many players. Oh, there's too many players. I've tried, I've tried remembering. Dude, the kid's like 19. Yeah, and that's that's um that's like Hawkins as well. Um, the number ten for Northland, he's he was killing yeah, dude. It on the weekend. He he, yeah, a lot man. Of great uh, like the, the big highlight though, because it was a younger forward pack, younger forward packs going at it, and just how fast they were, mm-hmm. which especially at the ruck was just it. It shocked me, man. It, I, I, it was high quality rugby, and I think um it that game could have gone either way, especially down to the wire towards the end. There, it was, it was looking really good. Definitely. James, what about you? What was your favourite part of that game? Mate, I actually didn't watch any of the uh, the Mitre 10 Cup, but uh, I bet on Waikato based on your tip. And they got <laughs> right, you always bet on Waikato, bro. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they never let you down. But yeah. mate, my sports I, I, tab, except for Zero Super tab Rugby. Accounts bit, sports yeah. tab account's a bit healthier thanks to your tip, mate. So, uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, so I did follow this round. Yeah. <laughs> no, but my, I think my favorite part about the comp in general is, is, is like you said, Holly, you've got a great mix of youth. And then 
they're ready to make a name for themselves in New Zealand and they'll come off the line and they'll make those big hits. But you've also got former All Blacks like Rennie Ranger, who's playing in Northland and who provides so much impact. Plus players like Jason Rutledge, who's the oldest player in the entire in, comp, yeah. 42, playing for Southland. We, we, always talk about, we always talk about how strong New Zealand's depth is, but is having players like this who run the hard yards for years and are able to provide so much wisdom, I'll ask you first, James, is, is what makes New Zealand strong? Do you think that's one of the big contributors? There's no doubt it is, mate. I think yeah. um, having kind of a mix of guys who are in their prime and not quite super rugby level with guys who are on the rise, with guys who are on the way out, um, that, that's amazing. So guys still play rugby because they love it. Um, and they can kind of impart some of their experience on the younger guys. And I'm actually seeing uh, little bits of evidence of that in the Shoot Shield in Sydney. Mm-hmm. So if you look at, um, if you watch the Shoot Shield in Sydney, like Mark Gerard played some games last year. Um, Adam Fry is like 41 years old and he's still mm-hmm. playing a bit of first grade at, at uh, Randwick. Yeah. And you're getting more and more elite level players who just enjoy playing some rugby on the Saturday afternoon and their body still has a bit of run in it. And the value that they offer to young guys on their way up is massive. Um, and that's definitely a huge, um, one of the huge benefits of the New Zealand system for sure. And do, do you think that the NRC will kind of get a same feel like that? Because obviously you've got a lot of players that are coming in from overseas comps who may not have gone back overseas yet. You still will have players that could go over to Europe that may not fulfill those contracts. Maybe not the exact same, but you'll still have a lot more experience than you did in previous years. I don't know the NRC. Like the way the NRC is run at the moment, it's been almost entirely young, ambitious guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the guys who are on their way out of professional rugby and still want to play rugby will probably just show out for their clubs on a Saturday afternoon. Um, yeah. I think the NRC trains too hard and they train like, they train like professionals and a 41 year old Adam Fry doesn't want to train four nights a week. He <laughs> yeah. just wants to kind of roll the legs over, learn what the line out calls are and uh, just be efficient on Saturday. Yeah, I agree with that. Any, any final points of the, the game that you'd like to aside from the forwards, Hullo, what, what do you think the, the comp overall of the Mitre 10 Cup provides to New Zealand rugby in general? Uh, better kickers than what we saw for the All Blacks turnout on oh, Saturday. Okay, all right, all right. You're getting restless. Let's, let's, jump, let's jump in and we'll talk, we'll talk about the All Blacks versus Australia. So, so as we all know that the game I'm referring to, the All Blacks versus the Wallabies, game one of the Bledisloe Cup series, the first test match rugby that we've seen in all of 2020 and we've been fiending for it around i think around the globe i'm i'm in the u.s and hull is in australia i think everyone considered who loves rugby has been wanting that and it i don't think we were expecting this game it didn't lack a lot of it didn't lack drama so the first off i want to talk about is obviously the refereeing i think any fan will have some sort of bias when supporting their team but i don't think there is any debate that the refereeing wasn't up to par in this test match of, of especially of this caliber. Although someone can make an argument that it was a very tough game to referee for anyone. You had mm-hmm. multiple screw ups for the whole refereeing team. The notable, notable few were Angus Gardner missing the foot in touch for Rico Ioani. The multiple mm-hmm. bad calls by Paul Williams, especially in the final eight minutes of the match where it was just yep. a free for all. James, yeah. James, I'll start with you first. What do you think was the biggest blunder or yet yeah, the biggest mistake caused by the referees? So it's a shame, like, the quality of that match with the world watching and the world celebrating that, that match, that every single report you've read afterwards has about They've 50%, ripped them. Yeah. About, yeah, 50, about 50% of the, uh, the ink has been going towards the refs. Yeah. Um, the best explanation I've probably heard of this was uh, from Morgan Turanui on the Rugby Ruckus uh, podcast. That's the second best uh, technical rugby breakdown um, podcast after your own, TJ. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it, yeah. <laughs> so he explained, he, he said, put yourself in Angus Gardner's shoes. Angus Gardner is celebrated back in Australia. Um, he won 2018 World Rugby Referee of the Year. Of the year. Yeah. And so there's, that was a time where Australia probably couldn't boast the best player in any position, but we had the best referee. And Australian rugby is extremely proud of him. Now he goes over to Wellington to to kind of officiate a match as AR that he probably shouldn't be on. And every time that there's a contentious call, he's very aware that he's Australian. He's very aware that he's refereeing the Australian side in a Wellington stadium. 
So maybe maybe he thinks he sees the foot go on the line and he says, it was touch and go. If they score, I'll recommend we go upstairs. Yeah, um, That's all I can imagine. Do you really want to flag in and say he stepped on the line if you're not sure of what you saw? That's a good point. Yeah, because you can very, always that's very refer good, back yeah. to it. Yeah. In the eighty first in the eighty first minute after the missed penalty goal, there's kind of the the scramble on the ground. There's a couple of phases. Um, Tupu from the All Blacks does what I think was probably the most obvious penalty of the game. Um, entering from the side, going off his feet, and handling the ball in a ruck. That's in the eighty first minute in front of the posts. Yeah. Does Angus Gardner really want to flag in and? flag in on a penalty that decides a Bledisloe Cup, aware of how the optics look. Like it's, and then Williams would be the same. Like Williams, I watched a lot of the Super Rugby Ataroa, and he was the best New Zealand referee. But yeah, I'd agree with he, that. He's on a hiding to nothing when you're refereeing New Zealand against Australia. And the mind games that would be going on in your head, the second guessing, the mm-hmm. being conscious of not being biased, kind of makes you bias. And so I think all those referees were basically set up to fail and they failed. Yeah. 100%. The, referee, the accuracy did, was horrendous. The refereeing was horrible. I think too, like in regards to the refereeing, you're right. It's a lose-lose situation. They can't fly in refs that are impartial. So they have to use Kiwi and Australian referees. Mm-hmm. And even doing that, there's limitations on how many personnel can be there from overseas, from Australia to be there too. So it's a lose-lose. Uh, no matter if, if it was 60-0, the Kiwi ref would still be copying it. Um, you know, if Australia win, Angus Gardner's getting his ass handed to him. Do you, it, was a, it was a lose-lose situation. But yeah. the job could 100% have been done a lot better from everyone okay, so involved. This, this, this will lead me into my next question. So this, this, will be a, this will be a quick answer, yes or no. Do you guys think Angus Gardner, with everything you guys spoke about, will do a better job in Auckland? So you got the game? I believe so. I believe he has the game in Auckland. Mate, Wait, I, as a I, AR or on field? No, as, as, as the referee. Centre ref. Yeah. I, I think he can control the players better. I did not like how... Um, the players were acting on the weekend. Um, and I do like Gardner when he's on the field. His communication skills are through the roof. And I like how he's quite direct, but also firm and still sort of on that, I'm your mate, but just remember, shut your yeah. mouth. Uh, yeah. So I think he'll be able to control the lads better. Um, yeah. But that's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> James, what do, you, what do you reckon? Mate, I think in, in Williams's defense, I reckon that was one of the most difficult tests to referee in some time. Mm -hmm. Um, There's been test matches between our countries recently where it's a 30-point game and and none of the decisions really matter. Where in the last 20 minutes of the game, um, the conditions are terrible, the intensity is high, and every decision matters. And, um, mate, I thought that was one of the most difficult games to referee I've seen in some time. Um, And if that happens again, then I think Angus Gardner is an outstanding ref. Yeah. You've got to worry about what his confidence level is like based on the media he's getting at the moment yeah. and the fact that uh, back home in Australia, he's, um, he's copping a lot of heat. Yeah. And it's I, not the I first think time I, he's copped it, though. He, he has copped That's a lot of heat. That's why I like class, Gardner. Yeah. He's almost... I, I Actually, I genuinely like him as a referee because I think he just cops it on the chin. He's like, ah... Like, that's what I get from him. He's just like, uh, yeah. I had a, had off I will, I will piggyback off that, though. I have said in multiple episodes with Huller and with other people that, that I think Angus Gardner, you did a tremendous job in the Super Rugby AU competition. He was definitely Australia's best referee. So, best of luck to him. I, we, I don't wish ill of anyone, especially a referee, because they've got a hard enough job as it is. But let's, let's move on to the, the next topic. And it's going to be an interesting one because Huller and I had a completely different perspective on how this one player played. And, and oh. his name is Matt Tamor. So, <laughs> So oh. I, I'm, I'm not saying he was the best player in the park. However, his defense, his defensive pressure was on point to disrupt the All Blacks continuity a lot during this game. And although his offensive ox- execution wasn't perfect, I think his decision-making or his thought process was quite good. So an example I'll, I'll, I'll give you is in the first half when the All Blacks had quite a heavy rush defense and Matt Timor had uh, basically an overlap and he had two options. He could take it into contact or he could throw a pass, 
that Jordy Barrett could pick off very easily. Or his third option could be he decided to kick for territory and keep the ball down in the All Blacks, All Blacks half. And he created considerable pressure. Although it didn't go directly to a player or it didn't go exactly where he wanted it to, I think it was the right mental consciousness that he was using. So, Hala, I know we've been quite honest and cr- critical about his play in previous episodes. What specifically didn't you like about Tamua's play for this test match? Okay, so first off, Dave Rennie made the right call having Matt Tamua there for the game that they were playing in Wellington. He should not be there in Auckland if it's dry weather rugby. That is – the reason why I say that is there – from what I can see – and from Dave Rennie's previous experience, and we, you know, long leave the Chiefs, um, I find that Matt Tamua is is inconsistent way too often more than he is consistent. On the weekend, you're right, and I agree that he made some good calls – he was also lucky that he was facing um, Richie Moonga, who wasn't playing too good, and Goodhue at 12 and Yuana at 13. If they just straightened that lineup and ran at him, he's completely inefficient for the Wallabies' back line. And now you're bringing it down to James O'Connor to do something and Hunter Baisami on debut. Um, now, having said that, did I rate his game on the weekend? I, I was still, I'm still a no. I just think that it played... Dave Rennie's coaching played really well with Matt Tomore being there. Um, I just don't think moving forward that he's your number one choice uh, for number 12, given there have been some injuries. Um, and I, I honestly just don't feel as though... Like, this weekend, if it's dry weather, I fear that Matt Tomore will be targeted, as he should have been on the weekend. And we're going to see exactly what happened during Super Rugby... Australia this year, when once he's targeted, he's completely inefficient and he's off the field in under 50 minutes. Okay. All right. I'll take that. James, your thoughts? I think that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening to your podcast and uh, most weeks I think, yeah, it says some harsh. Mate, um, Tamua didn't set the world on fire. He, he didn't really make any uh, like big impact plays, but um, you just mentioned that you don't really know what um, his instructions were from Dave Rennie. And his instructions may have been just rush up and tackle, catch and pass, and then kick whenever their line speed's quick. So I think he probably underplayed his hand and that may have been his instructions. I also think that in terms of selections, uh, Wallabies fans have got one eye on the next World Cup because we've got such a good crop of young guys. But if you're trying to pick a side to win a Bledisloe Cup in New Zealand, you really got to pick for experience. And the alternatives to um, Tamua were probably Araya Simone, who I rate very, very highly, um, or Lola Seo. And I think they're both huge talents and great young players. And they'll eventually take um, Tamua's spot. But as a Wallabies fan, if you're trying to win a Bledisloe, you've got to probably pick Tamua. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, f- I, feel like, I feel like I'm a referee in this, in this colourful jersey and I've got well, Wallabies on so- one side and all Blacks <laughs> on the other side. Can I, can I say then, James, would you say Lolosio at 10 and O'Connor at 12 would be a better attacking option with Pattaya out and Hunter Baisami at 13? Because ideally, I would love to see that red spine in there, O'Connor, Baisami and Pattaya, given Pattaya's injured, obviously, Baisami's there at 13. But what is, would you is think? Pattaya, is Pattaya out completely or is he just out for this week? I think he's I haven't week. Read, sorry, I think he's just, week to week. So he'd be... He could be ready for this Saturday, but I think um, Paisami played so well that there's no... He played awesome. He was amazing. Um, He was amazing. But what do you think about Lolo Sia starting at 10, O'Connor shifting into 12? Or, you know, during the game um, this this week, could could you see that happening? I think we would score more points and I think we would concede more points. So I don't know... That's fair, man. Yeah. I think think the the organisation, the X factor would be improved the organization and the composure would probably fall apart a fair bit. Yeah, that's fair, in, a, in, a, in a really high pressure test in Wellington, um, in the rain, after not playing a test in 10 months, I'd probably want to move there. And yep. I think, I think these other guys, Lola C will get his chance over the next month. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. I just think with these young guys too, like, from a coaching point of view, I think this is the great time. This is the greatest time in the world where maybe that X factor that 
Chica didn't want to play for so long. This is the time where it's like, in worst case, you just lose again. You know, and not to sound mean, but it's just like, let's just like, we don't need to, we don't need to softly bring him in. Hunter by some is the perfect example. That guy was on fire. Dengunu well, that's, on fire. That's, that's the, that's the next, that's the next topic I wanted to move into. So we, we talked about great debut performances for the Wallabies. You obviously had Wilson as well. Um, Filippo Dungunu, very exciting to watch. But I thought Hunter Paisami was easily the best debutante. He was he was able to penetrate the line constantly. He made some very impactful tackles in high pressure situations, and I think he's only scratched the surface of his potential in the gold jersey. So James, should Dave Rennie stick with the same back line, the conversation that we're having, or if Pattai is healthy and Wright's healthy, should they be given a shot in this week? Mate, I think you got to stick with it. I think um, like the guys, like I think. Most of those guys at 9, 10, you can say what you want about Tamura at 12, but um, 13, certainly. I think, mate, they all played above themselves. They all mm-hmm. did enough to hold their jerseys. And, um, mate, your point about uh, all these kind of rookies who had amazing games, mm-hmm. that may not be a coincidence. Yeah. There's a generation of Wallabies players who've got a lot of baggage against the All Blacks mm-hmm. um, and have got yeah. a lot of losses and a lot of tough experiences against the All Blacks. And you've now got a bunch of debutants who have beaten the All Blacks at under 20s level and schools level. Exactly. And there's, there's a lot less fear. And if they can get some wins now, the rest of their career, they'll respect the All Blacks, but not fear them. Yeah, so that's probably... what... It... Sorry, James, you go. Now, there's a generation of players, of uh, Wallabies players who've probably just moved on, who have a lot of baggage and have about eight years of losses um, yeah. behind them there. That's what I mean, and that's what I wanted to touch on is guys like Lolo Seo and, you know, Hunter Paisami, they they don't care about the black jersey. They respect it, but it's just another – they beat them. They've done it numerous times, not one-off. We're talking on the big stage, which is why, um, you know, I'm like – look, it was an awesome game to watch, and, you know, regardless of the draw, it was beautiful to watch to, like, you know – Literally at 80 minutes, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> but I, again, I think that's what I just, I want to see these younger guys come through because they're merciless. Hunter Baisami made Rico Yuane look like a little punk. And yeah. that's no easy feat considering Rico Yuane was a standout for the Blues he this was, year. He was the form, he was, he was said to be the form 13 in, in the Super Rugby Arturo competition. So yeah, that's, exactly. that's saying so, something. Yeah, man. And I agree, James. Those are great points. Like, let the kids play, yo. You had your time. You couldn't beat them. I'll see you later, Matt Tamor. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just contradicted my, my answer from the previous question, didn't I? I said, pick on experience. And then I said, get the, get the experience yeah. out of there and pick on you. So. That's all right. Okay. My psychology, uh, my psychology <laughs> degree is coming through. <laughs> uh, I've said it before and I'm saying it again. Can we stop hating on a guy who I went to school with, please, so much? Dude, I be, think he's the We he can be critical of him, genu- but he's leave him genuinely- alone to a point. <laughs> Dude, I like him as a human being. He's great. Comes from a great family. I know his mom, for goodness sake. She's, she's awesome. Shout I'm out just to the saying, family. She doesn't I'm care just... for you anymore. You keep <laughs> <doesn't>. <laughs> <laughs> when was All the right, last let's... time he called you, TJ? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. I spoke to his sister the other day, but yeah, last time I spoke to Matt, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. So, yeah. but I'm I'm supportive. State high boys. You got to, You got to always have that. But let's let's switch gears and let's talk about the All Blacks. So the one person I think the who the Wallabies came prepared for, especially was Richie Moanga. We spoke about it before. He did have a handful of plays where he did show that he is the quality number ten. He everyone knows him to be, but Australia contained him very well. And I I, I go to a point where I saw. Tupo will just come right off the line and just whack him straight away. That, he did not. He did not care. So, Hulla first. Does Does Richie deserve to start again for this next game, or is it time to put Bodie in the number ten jersey? No, nah, look, you got to stick with him. Uh, what happened on the weekend was Dave Rennie's coaching masterclass. That Dave, uh, what we saw was Australia play Kiwi rugby to a certain extent, especially off um, in defense. That rush defense, making sure that their tens are getting done. And then that shift out. Um, Sakai Loto coming in at lock, that adds another loose forward to the dynamic, Incredible. which gives Incredible you speed impact. in defensive yeah. line. Um, but Richie Moonga, bro, like what we saw was, I think, cockiness first and foremost. Um, he definitely thought he was faster than, you know, he, he could react faster than he, he, he could. And that's what happened. He got caught and he never recovered. And having Goodhue at 12 
that doesn't help the situation anymore. You know, at least if you've got Anton Leonard Brown, who I am critical of, but at 12, he can take that pressure off, run that ball straight, crash it, and give you time, give that 10 time. I will um, say critical I would... is an understatement, but, can, but continue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but look, you, you, you got to start, um, you got to start Richie again. And, you know, with Bodie Barrett back at 15 too, that adds a, a d- again, a uh, deeper dynamic where I think the Wallabies defense won't know which way, if, especially if they're split, who they're rushing. Um, and if Richie is getting rushed, uh, Richie, uh, Richie stops the fullback, Bowden Barrett comes up to 10, and then you've got another headache on your hands. Yeah. James, your thoughts? Mate, I think, um, I think you know, hit the nail on the head. In the World Cup last year, whenever Barrett was playing fullback and Mango was uh, 10, any midfield ruck, you'd have one of them as first receiver on either side. And that just becomes very, very difficult to defend. So I think if if Barrett has 15 on his back, he is probably 15 in defence and from starter players. And I think he's at first receiver as much as Moamu. So, mm-hmm. mate, it's a good it's a good dilemma you guys have to have to do, make these selection decisions. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, mate, as soon as as soon as some of our starters drop out, we're scratching for test quality players. Mm-hmm. And New Zealand is blessed for the depth. So, mm-hmm. mate, I will you... say, yeah, I will say though. Um, I just read today that Barrett and the other Barrett are a bit, a bit hesitant. Why? Well, I think one didn't train today. I think Bo didn't train today. Geordie walked out with ice on his leg and he was limping off. Uh, Sam Whitelock, he um, is still undergoing concussion protocols. So we're still a bit banged up. Which obviously Aussie, Aussie did a pretty good job. So well, well done, James, on that one. Um, but one player we have to bring up is Rico Iwani. So although he oh. put together a few, <laughs> a few great attacking efforts, his, his biggest moments in the games were stepping out of bounds that Angus Gardner missed and knocking on that try. That could have been the difference maker in the game. So, James, you first. How, how big of an impact to the game were these mistakes? Mate, I think um, from a New Zealand perspective, I thought uh, Rico Iwani kind of cost New Zealand the game. I mm. think um, the knock on before half time had a massive impact. Um, that would have been such a, such a devastating psychological blow to the Wallabies. But getting those seven points back just before half time probably kept us in the match to an extent. And then if you watch um, the, uh, I think it was our first try from the line out mall, mm-hmm. um, Corabetti, um, you'll see that I only bid in on um, Hunter Paisani mm-hmm. as a decoy runner. Yep. All of his defenders were heading out and drifting and Oani planted his feet and we put the ball in behind him and that led to the try. So mm-hmm. if he cost a try in attack and he cost a try in defence in a match that tight, um, mate, there's probably, there's probably a good case not to select him next week. Mm-hmm. Hola, do you, do you think he deserves to be in the 13 jersey again this week or do you think it's time to give someone else like an Umanga Jensen or a... Or another no, player. Look, goes. I'm going to go one step further. I think A or B needs to come in at 12, good Hugh at 13. And we need to shove him to the wing and drop Geordie Barrett if he's fit to play. And do you think Umanga Jensen or someone else like that caliber or LMRP, if he's, if he's healthy, do you think that that's the difference maker on the bench? Off the bench, you'd have to say Lamape. I don't think Umanga Jensen's ready for test match footy yet. No matter, he had an amazing season. Um, but that safety net of Jordy Barrett, who can come in as an outside back, I bet too slow for wing, I think, personally. Um, and Lau Mape and ALB and Yuane are your other options. I think they just give you... I'll bet Yuane played terribly. Um, and James is right. It, it's not so much dropping the ball, but more so the fact that defensively he's just not reading. And he did that all game too. Mm-hmm. Um and I thought, I honestly thought, especially down um, the left side, uh, the right side of the All Blacks, uh, with George, George was playing right or left, right, yeah, right, um, yeah, that they were just getting a little too carved up defensively. So, mm. yeah, look, I, I don't think Umanga Jensen's far off. I don't think he's there yet, and I, I'm pretty sure Lau Mape is still under the injury cloud with his arm. Um, but I know they're looking at, it, they're considering him for this weekend, which goes like which makes you think that perhaps they're going to do that push, bring an ALB at 12 with good okay. at 13. Hmm. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about the, the man leading the ship for the All Blacks. So as, as someone who, a, a lot of people who thought to be... We ate our words, bro. 
Yeah, I know. He thought to be under-deserving of the captaincy this whole year. Sam Kane showed over the weekend that he's here to stay and he doesn't care whether you like it or not. And I'm, I'm a big Sam Kane fan. Always have been. Always will be. But even though he provides a good leadership standpoint, I still don't think he is New Zealand's best number seven. With, with that being said, he is their captain. He's obviously not going anywhere. He's not going to be benched anytime soon. Hollow, with that in mind, do you think the benefits of his captaincy leadership, plus what he showed over the weekend, helps make up for what the All Blacks could be missing from another player in that jersey? You know what? I enjoyed the Kane, Severe, Frizzell experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was an interesting experience. I think what Sam Kane definitely lacked, he made up. I thought Sam Kane had a blinder of a game, to be honest with he you. He had an amazing game. I'm, n- I'm never going to deny that. I also think he'd be suited at six and then they need to bring in someone else at seven. Mm. Um, Frizzell, for me, although... Who who are you thinking? Like a Papali'i or... Well, that was my choice from a... Look, let's be honest. The Wallabies got to every work before everyone else. The Wallabies were insanely, insanely fast Mm -hmm. on the ruck and in in defense off the ruck too. Um, and it shocked me. The only person that I could really think that was there and that was countering that much, although our Artie Sever did get some turnovers, I'll bet a little more illegal than legal. Uh, Sam <laughs> Kane was definitely, was definitely at those rucks. But again, I just didn't... Yeah, look, I just don't think that... You know, we've, we have to come to the conclusion he's not going to not play. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to see him perhaps in a sixth position and then bring in a Papali'i in at seven just to add a bit more grunt. Um, especially mm. off when Richie Moong is under trouble, man, they, they really needed, and I don't think Frizzell uh, needed that, that inside or outside channel just to have someone there just to run straight. Mm. Um, and as, as good as Frizzell was, I just think he lacked that, you know, almost that via Fifita killer instinct. Like, just give me the ball. I'll give you some time, momentum. And Sam Kane can't provide that. He's not that player. Um, which is why I think he'd be better suited for six if they're trying to play, if they're trying to counter what Australia are bringing to them, which is probably the best um, defensively and fastest forward pack we've seen in quite a while. Yep. James, thoughts? What, do you think he, he's, he's worthy of that jersey or do you think he, you put someone else in there? Mate, he was an absolute pest to us on, on the weekend. He's, um, and that's, the, that's kind of what you look for in a good seven. Um, just a massive pest, just disruptive. Every time we're building momentum, he'd either poach or slow a ball down. Um, a couple of times he put really good defensive shots on and kind of put some of our ball carriers on their back. And these are some things I didn't really see from him in the uh, Super Rugby. Um, I think when you're picking your back row, it's all about balance. So if you're worried about him not having penetration in his running, um, you're getting that from your six and your eight. Uh, if you're worried about him not being a line-out option, you're getting that from your six and your eight. So if you're getting leadership, uh, good defence and a heap of poaching from your seven, mate, you'd probably take that. Mm, okay. All right. Yeah. I, hands down, I think, I think he played a great game. He, he proved a lot of people wrong, I think, who have been doubters. I, I, like I said, I still won't say he's, he's our best number seven, but he's the seven we've got and we're going to stick with him for, for, for the ride. But I think the last topic that we're going to talk about is pretty obvious the coaching. So both Ian Foster and Dave Rennie are both brand new coaches and it was their first opportunity to showcase what their teams are capable of. With the score tied up after 89 minutes of play, it was ridiculous. Who had the better performance as a coach? James, I'll start with you. Who, who do you think? Mate, I think, um, I think our man had probably a better performance. I think um, he probably, Rennie had he, we were heavy underdogs to be honest. Um, that was Both of them were in their debut, so neither of them had a heap of time to prepare. Um, I think Rennie's experience and knowledge of the New Zealand players, I thought was was a huge benefit. Um, I thought there was a whole lot of moments and little nuances in his match strategy that showed that he knew exactly who he was playing against. Um, And then it just looked like a coherent plan. Like there was like outside in defence... And all of the back line knew it and all of them kind of bought in and did the a same. Lot of, a lot of cohesion, yeah. So so if you look at um, like Ione's like miss in defence that led to a try, the inside backs were doing one thing, Ione was doing another thing. And that was a sign of a bit of, um, bit of disjointed kind of coaching. And the players got to take ownership of it. But the way I looked at um, the Wallabies, I thought they kept it quite simple. 
defensively, they all knew what they were doing and they all followed the same plan. I think in attack, they scaled everything back and I only probably saw about three or four, maybe three attack shapes all day. Mm -hmm. um, but the guys kind of kept it simple, kept the errors low. And I think that's probably like the first layer of Rennie's plan. And so I'm very excited to see what kind of comes off the back of that and like understanding the basic stuff first and how does he layer that. And mate, I didn't know much about Rennie, but um, a lot of people who, are, who know a lot about rugby considering one of the world's best coaches. Yep. Yep. That's a really strong start. I'd love to have him at the Chiefs right now. <laughs> Yo, for real. Uh, Hala, agree, disagree? Who, who do you think? I agree with everything James said. Yeah. Look, what we saw was exactly. Look, we've seen, like, as Chiefs fans, we've seen this ex happen exactly the same way on our way to our premiership. So mm -hmm. um, it scares me because he, he has rattled the All Blacks cage. Um, mm. And I haven't seen an Australian team what we saw Unison man, and it was beautiful. It was it was so good to see, and mm. I think um, we spoke about it during the season. The Sakai Lotto, um, like where do you play him? Uh, mm -hmm. Keeping him at lock, like that is a masterstroke move. And I I'm interested to see how they're going to improve their lineouts though. Um, that's one thing from a coaching point I'm looking at because. I just feel as though if there was a weakness, that lineout could be disturbed, by, and not just by the All Blacks. So like, I think every team's looking at that lineout, going, okay, well, this is what happens when you want to play an experienced lock. I bet how good he is mm -hmm. yeah, as, a, as, a, a, as a back rower and a lineout option. He's still not your main. You don't have two jumpers there that know how to handle business. So, yeah. from a coaching point of view, I'd love to see how Dave and the team handle that. But he hand, like, Dave Rennie wins that. And to be honest, the Wallabies deserve to win that match because they were I agree. They, they, yeah. they, they were out coached. The All Blacks were out coached. Um, and you know, they were beyond the refereeing, the Wallabies just played uh, a brand of footy that um, Dave Rennie's taught them to play. And that unison is definitely what should have won them the game. And they were just unfortunate for it not to happen. Mm -hmm. Ian Foster's got a lot of work to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm I think, to um one yep. more point to uh, the, the discussion about the line out. It was a massive, massive weakness, and that's a problem. Um, the hooker and the two locks, the three of them have never been played on the same together. field, the same team together. So, so you've um, got Philip, Solakai, Loto, and Falao. So those, yeah. yeah. So yeah. to have like three national team players who have never played together, whether in Super Rugby or club or age grade stuff is quite unlikely. So, mate, it was it was a massive problem. I expected to get it I expected to get better each week. Well, and it was wet weather too, and that's and it was windy as shit. Like, you know what I mean? There's definitely I mean, but like again, that just comes down to player management, not even that like, you know, on the field stuff. This doesn't come down mm -hmm. to Dave. I'm it'd just be really interested to see how that goes yeah. um this weekend in dry rugby. Sure. I do want to ask though, do you think Jack Gordon should be on the bench or take McDermott James? Oh, mate, Ooh. again, on form, you've got, to pick, um, you've got to pick McDermott on form. If you're trying to win a test match, maybe I was happy with Gordon, mate. I'm a big Gordon fan. Well, okay. here's the thing. Like, I definitely – I've never been a fan of um, White. He did have a good game. Amazing game. Mm. Um, but I was actually – Here's a question that I want to ask, though, is do you think he – do you think he balked and went too many times? Yes, during, during the game. That's that because I, I thought. Bro. Yeah, I thought that during the game, I do. I will. I will concede that I think he did have a very good game. He and there were many points that he provided, great continuity, great passing, but there were too many times where all he needed to do was make that one more pass, and then they were in, and he went dummy into contact into three people. So well, and this yeah. is and this is that's what I was about to say is I thought I was really impressed with Gordon when he came on. That continuity and that ball movement were like that was faster ball than the uh, um O'Connor and Tamora had all game. Yeah. So I, I would like to see Gordon get a bit more minutes, but I'm man, I'm right at Tate McDermott for number nine for the World Cup at least. I think you, I think you have been you have been for the last year. <laughs> Dude I mean <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so quick, 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 quick question to finish off this. So obviously loving the test match rugby being back, but who was your favorite player and least favorite player of the match? Hala, we'll start with you first. Dude, you're going to be shocked. Michael Hooper. As your favorite. As my favorite, dude. That's, 
Are we Dude, are we an opposite I, day? I am allowed. Like I love giving it out, but when I can eat my words, I will. Yeah. I will take that and I'll. I will swallow it happily. He yeah, I, played, think, I think that's the one thing that a lot of people don't get from you is that, that you're so passionate about a lot of things is that they don't understand that if you're wrong, you'll cop it. Where a lot of people think that because you're so passionate, they'll they'll just be like, no, if I tell him he's wrong, he's gonna he's gonna eat me alive. Dude, I have I haven't seen Michael Hooper captain like that and play like that in a very long time, which is why I've been really critical of him. And I was thoroughly impressed with just his um leadership across the paddock and just the little things he was doing. It wasn't anything major, but it was like getting the boys up off the like literally grabbing up Nella to say, get up, you're at post or pillar yeah. and then shooting off. It was him like, at, instead of having a bitch like he usually does during games where things aren't going his way, he's just like, sir, can you tell me what happened? And that's it. He doesn't talk back and he's communicating to his team. Mm-hmm. Um, and I honestly, again, which is why I think Dave Rennie is the best option as coach is that's Dave Rennie really sitting down and saying, look, this is what we need from you. This is your gift. Do it like this and watch what happens. Because Michael Hooper's head, not once did his head go down. Not once was his body language, you know, in a negative position. He was, hands are always clapping. He's always yapping. And that's what I think he's missed. And I was thoroughly impressed with his leadership. Um, and on, he, he was a terror, bro. Like, he annoyed me in, like, the best possible way. So, yeah, man, Michael Hooper was my, was my personal favorite player of, of the weekend. All right. Quick answer. Who was your least favorite? Rico, you won it. Okay, there we go. All right, James. No, actually, favorite. Jordy Barrett. Jordy Barrett. Wow. Okay. No, I'm not yeah, even going to go to you anymore. You stay away. All right. Yep. James, favorite, <laughs> least, least favorite. Least favorite um, was Rico Ayani. I've got massive respect for him and he's a freak talent. He had a very bad day. And then I think my probably favorite was Felipe Jamgunu. Mm-hmm. Um, he had an awesome uh, Super Rugby AU. I wasn't sure that he'd take the step up. And I'm a big fan of his now, and I'm a believer. Yeah. Okay. Well, my favorite, I think a lot of people are going to be shocked by this one because we had very minimal minutes, was Caleb Clark. Because as soon as yeah. he came on the field, That's he why was you should be there instead of Geordie. Yeah. <laughs> you shush. Okay. Uh, my <laughs> least favorite, even though even though you've got wet weather considering, Folau. His, that, his line-out's terrible. That dummy pass he tried to throw that led to Rico's <laughs> almost try, even worse. So, but the front yeah, row that, play, bro. Oh, I'm not going to let him play anything. He was terrible. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about South Africa and their potential not to join the rugby championship. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back. Uh, so just want to have a quick shout out. We are 29 episodes deep of the Bonus Point Rugby podcast. So super excited to announce that. Big thank you to everyone who has supported the show so far. Um, can't wait to hit number 30 on our next episode. Uh, but it's called the Bonus Point for a reason. And we're going to stick with our theme of Test Match Rugby and talk about the rugby championship. So it's recently been reported that South Africa rugby has made a statement and the Springboks have said the Springboks ability to participate in the rugby championship would be finalized early next week. So that's leaving a lot of, I guess, emphasis on finalized and neither Rugby Australia or Sansa, which oversee the tournament, have been notified that the Springboks are considering withdrawing. So expect they will be participated as planned, but once they they still need to get approval from South African government. So the concern for the Springboks is they have not played a match since beating England in the last year's World Cup in Japan. Their best players have just only resumed playing after the pandemic lockdown that has been going on so long in South Africa. Um, And this has left the world champions at a distinct disadvantage heading into the tournament against the All Blacks, the, the Wallabies and the Pumas who are already in Australasia preparing. So, Overseas reports suggest that the Springboks director, uh, Rassi Erasmus, uh, wants to forfeit the championship, citing player welfare. But it is understood that South Africa rugby would incur a massive financial hit that would threaten to send the organization broke, leading to conjecture that the Springboks would instead send a development squad to fulfill their broadcast and sponsorship obligations. Now, we've obviously seen in previous years that if the Springboks did pull out, we could run a championship with three teams, just like the old tri-nations competition but the question is what is the better option for the spring box so i personally think that if they were to send a development squad over to fulfill their broadcasting and sponsorship obligations and struggle i think majority of people will understand due to the circumstances they've had to endure this because of covid but 
if that happens, I think the development squad should be given the same precautions by the South African rugby that they would have taken if they sent over their top tier squad. So, James, I'll come to you first with this. Should South Africa send a development squad over and compete and risk tarnishing their championship image, or should they pull out altogether, risking the legal backlash and from their sponsorships and broadcasts and potentially bankruptcy? I'm I'm all about treating every test match as a test match. So you mm. you never use them as an excuse to give some young guys a game. You pick your best side available. Um, you got to show a test match the respect it deserves, um, and that's kind of what separates our sport from some other sports. To be honest, is uh, like the international level of it. Um, the the virus is throwing up all sorts of like wild um, challenges in terms of putting together a rugby program and playing and traveling overseas. So some sympathy there. Um, But some of the chat coming out of South Africa since the World Cup has been confusing. Mm. I think they've got a head coach who never played a game of rugby. Have you heard that? Yep. So he he um, he started as a support staff or as a physio. He was a physio. Wow. I think he was a physio. He started as a rugby physio, worked his way up. And I think he's just been appointed by Rassi Erasmus, who has stepped into the um, director of rugby role. To the South African head coach. Mate, he, they had... Um, who's the other guy they had? Who's uh, De Villiers? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's insane. It can't be any worse than De Villiers, but... Uh, <laughs> mate, it's, it's just weird. Like, it's a strange, strange chat coming out of South Africa. Mm-hmm. And they're coming off the back of a World Cup win. And if that was the Wallabies, you'd want to see them really defend every match, uh, play every match as defending champions and throw everything at every test. So, Okay. Mm. And Hala, I think I know your answer to this. And it's, if they were to descend a, a development squad, how do you think they would, they would fare against a, a top-tier New Zealand side or even an Argentinian side? Yeah, they'd lose. I love you. Man, I love you straight pumped. to the point. It's, I love you straight to the well, point. Well, no, I'm like, here's the thing. Like, um, I've, I don't like the chat coming from Erasmus. Um, the excuses. Uh, look, they're looking to make as much money as possible. That's what's happening with this. They knew that they were going to be up for, you know, up to six, seven months. The, the, the dollar value is 300 million rand, which is about 23, 24 million Australian dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've now just realized, I think that, you know, you're going down the barrel of, this is a bad, it's, it's a bad situation that they put themselves in and they're just trying to find the easiest way to make it look like they're making a sacrifice because their players have been out. I just read this morning that their captain Khaleesi was just saying, yep, we're hundred percent unprepared. We're going to be the less fitter teams. Uh, the, the less fitted team, uh, we're going to be the less developed team in regards to player interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and these all play um, a factor into the decision. And I, I honestly think, uh, I'm not looking into it too much. I think it's a distraction. I think they are coming um, because the South African Rugby Union need that $24 million. It, it, I, I don't think it's got anything to do with player welfare, as sad as that sounds. And I think it's just Rassi Erasmus. Um, Trying to just, stir up some controversy. Exactly, just because he understands. And look, like James said, COVID-19 has affected everyone. Um, and yes, you know, you have, you, you'll have to come a long way, but so are the Pumas. Um, and, you know, the, if the Pumas who had a t- half team full of COVID-19 and they can make the arrangements and the appropriate player welfare management system put in place to make it to Australia to play, South Africa don't have an excuse. You are the world champions. It's a test match. We don't need your second best players. We want your team to come here. And look, and if they do lose and they don't perform, we understand. You haven't had time. You've had two, three weeks of rugby. That's fine. But the, the excuses coming out of South Africa are rubbish. Um, and James is right. The, he, was a, uh, he was a physiotherapist for the Natal Sharks in Free State. <laughs> and made his way into coaching. <laughs> Yeah. I don't think I've I don't think I've ever heard of that. It was was where you've got like a a, a tier one program, and I even I understand COVID is its own beast. But you've you've got how many other coaches that you could pick from in South Africa who are more than qualified for that position? Give them a shot. Don't go to a physiotherapist who's never played a game of rugby in his life. 
That's oh, that's horrendous. Okay, all right. Well, I, that that wasn't the way I wanted to end the show, but let's <laughs> let's 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 wrap up and on a, on a good note, and let's make our final match prediction. So, James, as as you're the new guest on this show, I will go to you first, and I I kind of feel because we've got jerseys on <laughs> that we're going to be predicting. <laughs> who's winning, but I want to hear who's winning this weekend's game in Auckland between New Zealand and Australia and by how much. So what's the score? And can we also add in how, how they're going to win? Would that be what, cool? do you, what do you mean how? So like, how, like, how are they going to compose the, um, like, what's their, what's their game plan pretty much? All right, elaborate. Yeah, la- elaborate for me. Do you want to go first, Tyler? No, guess first, oh. please, James. Okay. So I think... Um, <laughs> Mate, uh, my heart's been broken too many times by like strong Wallabies performances backed up by flat Wallabies performances. And you could argue that some of that is like flat All Blacks performances followed up by great All Blacks performances. Yeah. We haven't won in Auckland for so long. Um, it doesn't look good. So I'm going to pick the All Blacks, but I'm going to pick it by a small margin. And I think we'll continue to improve. I saw heaps of um, lots of areas in our game where we could get a whole lot better. And I think if we defend the way we did, um, if we attack within our systems and keep things simple and our set piece improves a little bit, we get a bit more luck from the referees. I think this could be a win or it could be a, a close Wallabies loss. I think just to piggyback on that, and I hate saying this as an All Blacks fan, but... I think when you when you look at the depth and the potential of both programs, although the All Blacks are very, very strong, they've got a lot of depth, I do think that Australia's depth is going to be most deadly in the next one to two years because they've got so many young players that are so mm-hmm. hungry, like your Tate McDermott, your Lola Seos, that are just players ready to go. And I think that in the next year, when we've got hopefully a healthy... I guess, perspective on life and able to put COVID to the side, I think we're going to have a really good crack. But how are your thoughts? Who's going to win and by how much? And I agree your with game James, plan. actually. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with James. I, I think the All Blacks just tip them, um, but not by much. I, like, it'll be, you know, 12 to 14 points at a maximum. That's what my head's telling me. Um, I think a little closer than that, too. Um, I think... it. I do believe it could get away from the Wallabies um, mm. just pending on a, a, a few things. And I think the broken play, even in the wet weather really showed uh, mm. structural issues with um, how Australia do play in their, in their pieces, how they do it, in that, in, it with their defense. Um, if it's dry weather, I think that that could be a real big disadvantage just from broken play and it could run away. But yeah, I, I honestly think if, if we don't pick up, our um, our ruck defense and even in attack, just getting quicker to the rucks, the turnover is going to give Australia ample opportunity, and they've shown that they can attack and will. Um, with the dry weather, I think Australia are going to hit by Sami a lot more on that inside line and just put pressure uh, in that mid in that midfield. And they've got Tamua O'Connor, Dengunu at the back on one side. Then on the other side, you've got Banks rolling through as well and i just think that australia have a really good chance to score points that way mm-hmm. um the all blacks i think they they need to hit that middle channel a little bit more take some more out of the equation just get him tired um and they need to they just need to attack a lot uh what's the word i'm looking for aggressively and be a lot more aggressive at the breakdown just so they can get that quicker ball and i think that fast ball and if barrett does play at fullback that's that's a bit game over. You're going left or right, and I I, I rate. I no offense. I I just think that one on one, I'll back an All Black over a Wallaby at the moment, except for Hunter by Sami, because that guy's a freak yeah. and he's amazing. <laughs> yeah. James, any final words? Uh, no, not really, mate. I think um, you mentioned some of the guys who aren't getting picked for the Wallabies in the moment. Mm-hmm. I think your your team is only as good as the guys who are missing out. Yeah. Um, Hullo mentioned some of the All Blacks players who were injured or unavailable or missed selection. And that's a, that's a test level side of guys who miss out. And I think, um, like you said, Australia's success in the next couple of years depends on blooding these guys and continuing yeah. to develop. And mate, for the first time in a while, I'm very optimistic about Australian rugby. Mm-hmm. And yes. we are, uh, mate, if we get a win, uh, and the worst, the worst sign of how we're at is that, New Zealand supporters are hoping that we do well too. 
<laughs> it's uh, we're at such a low point. We're at such a low point that the Kiwis uh, they need the Bledisloe to be relevant and competitive for rugby to be strong in New Zealand. And I eighteen think- years, eighteen yeah. years. So, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on that, and the I'm obviously gonna back the All Blacks, but I I think with Dave Rennie at the helm, I, I think you guys have both hit it nail on the head. He's doing it's such scary. a good job, and and the the pro the pro, the program is just has so much potential. I'm not going to give them a runaway win. I, I predicted it's going to be 24-20. Uh, so it's going to be definitely a close match. I can't wait for it. Um, but I think quick shout out to the All Blacks 15, the second tier team who won't actually get to come over to the uh, Canada and participate in the Halloween weekend uh, because that got cancelled. So disappointing that those some of those uh, tier two players even though they're still considered tier one players, um, won't get an opportunity to play some test match rugby. So that's that's a bit disappointing, but very excited for this uh, Australia All Blacks. Let Tate McDermott play. Put yeah, Tate McDermott on. Tate McDermott okay. for number nine. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you, should, you should be one of those um, recordings for um, for like uh, presidential campaigns. You, you speak yeah, right. to fast for anyone to understand. But a uh, big thank you to our guest analyst, Mr. Nobel Capote and uh, James Tesserero, helping me break down all that thank impressive you. gameplay over the weekend. Uh, be sure to check out the Rugby Nation for their 30-day shred, Fat Like the Pros Challenge, starting on November 1st. And be sure to check out our social media page to get savings on the program. And lastly, be sure to check out calpolyrugby.com uh, if you're interested in playing rugby in the beautiful Central Coast. I lived there for three years, and it was phenomenal. One of my favorite places I've ever lived in my life. So be sure to check out. Um, and hit James up so you can go check out the program. Um, and yeah, guys, excited for Test Match Rugby. Enjoy it. Thank you for tuning into the Bonus yeah, Point Rugby boy. Podcast, and we'll catch you guys next week. See ya. You found me on.